turn on computer and we are going. Okay. Hi folks, this is John Adamson, the Rehab and Documentation Guru. And today I'm blessed to bring you Kristen Digwood. Hi, Kristen. Hello. So I'm going to explain a little bit about Kristen's background and then she's going to elaborate and you'll understand why I've got her on the channel. So first of all, Dr. Digwood, by the way, I really like the sounds of that, Dr. Digwood. I think it, you know, it just it flows, it flows. Um, so Kristen first got her PT, and then she went back and got her DPT, correct? Exactly, yep. I always admire people that go back to school to get their um, transitional DPT, because, or even OTD, because that's a lot of work. Um, she is also CAPP, CAP certif certif Certificate of Achievement in Pelvic Physical Therapy, and there's going to be where our main subject matter is today. She's lymphedema certified. She's SFMA certified. I'm going to let her explain that. She's, she's an adjunct fac faculty physical therapy program um, teacher at Miser Misericordia. Am I saying that right? Yes. Yes. That's where I graduated from. Okay. And she is owner of Elite Spine and Sports PT, Elite Pelvic Rehab, Elite Custom Fitness. She's a freelance writer for the Advanced Magazine for Physical Therapy. She's a speaker and course creator for HomeCEUConnection.com. Wow. So that's a background. <laughs> that's so, very good. Yes. So the, the only so two questions. What's SFMA stand for? That's a selective functional movement assessment. So it's a specific way to look at the full body of a person instead of just zeroing in on where their injury is. So if you have a knee problem, your entire body gets screened. And it's a way to pick up where maybe the low back may be responsible for a problem in the hip or the ankle may be responsible for a low back problem. Okay, so just more expertise in a different area. Um, and we are going to talk mostly about, um, obviously, your experience in pelvic floor dysfunction. But uh, my next question to you is, do you ever get any sleep? A little bit here and there, yes. I <laughs> try to get a couple hours in every night. <laughs> okay, wow. So yeah, you are one busy person. And correct me if I'm wrong, but do you co-own your businesses with your husband? I do. He's also, he's a physical therapist. Okay. So we created it together and uh, we sort of split up things and come together on other things. Uh, ironically, I don't see him much. Everybody thinks it's great <laughs> to work with your husband, but, but we're running around all the time. I'm using a private room when I treat. We're going doing marketing in separate directions. So I'll go a full day and not see him. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe that's help keeps, keeps you sane so you can actually look at each other at the end of the day. Definitely. <gasps> well, what I'd like to do is have you tell us just a little bit about yourself. And if you want to delve into your background a little bit more, feel free. Okay. So I graduated in 1996. I was a first graduating physical therapy class at College of Accordion in Dallas, Pennsylvania. From there, I had done a, a bunch of different settings. So I was in patient rehab, I did some acute care, uh, but most of my settings were outpatient orthopedics. Ironically, when I went to school, there wasn't a whole lot known about pelvic rehab. I don't think I really got any of that in school. And I certainly didn't go into school thinking, oh, that's where I'm gonna go. I can't wait to graduate and start a pelvic program. Uh, but as time went on, that's where I gravitated to and ended up. Um, I've been doing administrative positions. I've overseen multi-clinics. And obviously, then I went down the path of pelvic rehab. Um, I started actually in teaching it, and it flowed from there. Uh, and then I- No pun intended. Certified. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> then, then I became certified in it and went to many more courses, started creating some of the courses, and it, all that background led me into private practice. So the last, oh, we're going on our eighth year of private practice now, where we went from being a one or two person show up to 25 people in the facility who are working, um, and we're sort of growing from there year to year. And it's been pretty exciting. It's been a lot of fun. Um, as we were talking about earlier, it's been a lot of work. 
So I always tell people when you go into private practice, just you know, expect that it's going to be a lot of work, but it's also very rewarding. Yeah, probably, you know, at some point, maybe I should have you on again, because I bet a lot of therapists are thinking about private practice right now and doing their own business with all the pair changes. Um, so I want to talk about pelvic floor rehab in particular, since you are a subject matter expert. And this obviously goes beyond incontinence by itself. So most therapists think of pelvic floor incontinence, but can you explain a little bit about the scope of practice related to pelvic floor treatment? Sure. A lot of people do think of it as incontinence. So when we talk about it, it's urinary incontinence. It's also fecal incontinence. Some people miss that component that, that they're one and the same and how we treat. We also treat, a lot of people don't realize we treat men, women, and we also treat children. A lot of people kind of miss the child aspect of it. We treat a lot of children who have issues with bedwetting past the time when they should be having accidents. We treat constipation. Um, we also have a whole other realm of diagnosis that we treat in the pain range. So when we talk about that from a pelvic perspective, we do some SI treatments, we do low back, but we also do treatments for people who are having challenges with speculum exams, chronic prostatitis that's causing pain, pudendal neuralgia, interstitial cystitis, where these things might have been thought more of a bladder issue people have come to see in the medical community that they have a pelvic floor component and they can't really be addressed by other things. We're seeing them come through our practice and getting great results with resolving their pain, getting them back to function, and having them just live all better lives through physical therapy. So it, there is a pretty large swath of things that you're dealing with, but what I'd like to do now is hone in on the incontinence issue. We know that Medicare is particularly tracking this issue. We see this in the post-acute care assessments, specifically for Part A. Hi, Kat. Um, hey, <laughs> it loves to get in on everything. <laughs> hey, sure, why not? The new star of the video. It's, it's gonna be famous now. What's your cat's name? This is Ted. He's uh, he's addicted to, to me and the family. He loves to be where I am, so it's it's quite flattering. <laughs> okay, well, welcome, Ted. Uh, so so with point with post acute care and incontinence being tracked so specifically by Medicare, can you share a little bit about the types of incontinence that you are dealing with? directly as a therapist. In other words, we can have direct impact and those types of incontinence that you see us more being indirect in our impact. Directly, we'll see stress incontinence, so accidents with coughing, sneezing, laughing, moving. We'll see urge incontinence, so having to go to the bathroom more often than previous or more often than would be seen as, as quote unquote normal. Uh, we'll also see a mixture of the two, and that's probably the most common. We'll see people develop both of those. Then we also see fetal incontinence, and they're probably what's most recognized by Medicare. They're the ones that they'll cover sit for biofeedback. So if you're going to do and get reimbursed for biofeedback, they're usually the ICD-10 codes that need to be done on them. Um, then I think I lost your picture. Could you still see me? Yeah, I can see you fine. Oh, it's my oh, video went out, but that's okay. They don't need oh, to look at me. Okay, they've got Ted behind me to look at. Yeah, they've at. got Ted. <laughs> so we'll see that those, and those right now are most often recognized by the payers. Other ones that we'll see and indirectly work on is overflow incontinence. We'll see um, some internal sphincter dysfunctions where Internal sphincters are not under voluntary control, so but the pelvic floor can sometimes help make up the difference. So we'll see those, and that'll indirectly help people with their problems. We'll see functional incontinence, and functional incontinence is something that I say every therapist could do because functional incontinence basically means they maybe can't get to the bathroom on time, they can't get their clothing off in time, and they have an accident. So that would be something we wouldn't directly see through. We have to get the pelvic floor better. But as therapists, we know if it's going to take somebody 20 minutes to get to the bathroom, they may have an accident. And somebody with a normal urinary system, normal pelvic floor, if they 
have to really get to the bathroom, they're just going to have that accident. And so we'll see that as an indirect part of physical therapy. Once we can get them there sooner, they can negotiate their clothing more quickly, then they don't have an accident. Um, so those are the main ones that we would see over and over throughout the variety of settings that we go through for incontinence. You know, and part of the reason I wanted to have you on was because here you are a physical therapist dealing with the yellow and the brown stuff that most PTs go, yuck, yes. I'm not touching that. <laughs> and, and we don't just have to leave that to the OTs. Both scopes of practice can address incontinence. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, so anyway, you brought up different types and you talked a little bit about um, how you can address either directly or indirectly a little bit. Why, make a case for the average therapist that's going to watch this video. Why should they become more familiar with pelvic floor dysfunction and pelvic health? For the, just therapists who may not say, oh, I can't wait to get in and go full bore. I just want to deal with incontinence and that for the, my whole rest of my career. All, many of your patients, and I bet most of the therapists, they encounter people every single day with problems in the pelvis. But they have this theory, as, as I had it too before I went into pelvic rehab, where we look at problems from the trunk down to the lower abdomen. There's an imaginary black box there, and then it picks up at the top of the thighs. And we sort of pretend like nothing's going on inside of there. I always tell therapists, especially when they're beginning to get into that, hit this, there's a lot of muscles in there. Those muscles do a lot of things for our patients. Many patients who have had chronic back pain, for instance, we've ignored the pelvic floor and that's part of the core complex. So it's not just the TA, it's not the multifidi only, the, the pelvic floor is in there supporting things. I've had people who just have back pain and they've had it for years. Once we start getting them to use the pelvic floor properly, the back pain starts to subside and sometimes completely goes away. Also, patients who maybe you're seeing for a knee problem who want to get back to running, their knee might get better, but they may stop exercising and getting back, not getting into their sports, not getting back into the game of life, as we usually will say, because every time they jump, they leak urine. They have some problems with that. So it is within the scope of all therapists to do some pelvic rehab or the musculoskeletal experts. We are kind of the ones who are going to do it. They go to their doctors. The doctors don't have time. They may say, oh, I think you have something on the pelvic floor. They give them a handout. A patient may or may not follow through with the handout. Statistically, we know if somebody's giving given a handout on Kegels, they will probably maybe get it right maybe 40%, maybe 30% of the time, or not do it at all. So as, as physical therapists, we're really in the position to address these problems, even if it's not so much that you're just going to spend your whole career in them, or if it's something that's very specific or a niche-based, knowing that, hmm, I might help a little bit, but this is something that some physical therapists spend their whole career doing and possibly referring them to somebody who can help with that specific problem or get them past the finish line on what they're having issues with if they feel that they need to dig a little bit deeper into the problem. Well, that's excellent. And I just want to touch base on a couple of things that you're saying and you, you didn't use this word, but you touched on it is a holistic approach to the patient's care. Definitely. Because like you said, there's kind of this black box for a lot of therapists. There is. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're not yeah. looking at the whole patient. Yes, yes. And, you know, I say the same thing to pelvic therapists. And that's why I love when pelvic therapists are not just pelvic therapists, they're also orthopedic clinicians. Because often I'll see somebody and I'll find out, you know, it's not just within the pelvic floor. Uh, it might be... a hip problem. It might be something coming from somewhere else. And if I just say, I'm a pelvic therapist, I'm just looking where the black box is that nobody likes to look, I may miss something outside of that area that's contributing into the pelvic floor. So it kind of goes both ways with orthopedics, neuro, and it comes together, I think, when you do learn a little bit about the pelvic floor and the function and how we can help as therapists. 
And just to put a plug in for those therapists that might watch this who are struggling to keep caseloads busy, this is an ethical and legitimate way to build your caseload if you truly address the full issues of the patient holistically, one of those being pelvic health. Definitely, definitely. Um, I see that a lot in all, now I'm, I'm an outpatient now, but I see that a lot within nursing home settings, personal care settings, home health. Um, sometimes we'll even get calls from homebound patients saying, is there anything, do you come to the house or anything you can do because I'm having this problem? And that would be a perfect thing for maybe a home health therapist to sort of get into to help these patients in their home or in um, nursing home settings. We've actually had patients that were transported from nursing homes to our clinics because nobody within their facility will kind of address the problem of the pelvic floor. Um, we've had people come in, uh, Boy, I had somebody that came on sort of like a, a gurney and they had to bring, wheel them in. It was a whole production. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if somebody just in that facility went to that patient's room and, and addressed this? But they just had nobody. There was a shortage in the nation of pelvic-based therapists. So I think anybody struggling to keep a caseload or to get the hours in, it might be a fantastic place for them to look to be able to serve the patients better within their facility and also you know, kind of keep themselves employed and getting the hours that they need. That's a great point and I couldn't have said that better myself. I, so one of the things that obviously uh, probably is on the mind of a lot of people watching this is, um, what are some barriers that you might face as a, as a Part B biller to being reimbursed for this kind of care? So you do, like any other thing in physical therapy or any of the medical professions, you do have to know what the billers will and, and won't cover. Um, there are certain specific things that say Medicare will cover and you, the, the patient has to qualify either by diagnosis or by other things they've tried. A, a great example is biofeedback. A patient has to have tried something for 30 days to understand the exercises before you will actually get reimbursed for your biofeedback. So that can get kicked back out to the clinician. If you're using that billing for it, you have to know the guidelines. We also have to really understand what we're doing and spell it out in the documentation. I think sometimes therapists go in and they just get so good at, at what they do, they forget that there's a huge skill component behind what they're doing. They write their notes and it doesn't scream the skilled aspect behind it. They're always going to want to know, well, why can't this patient just do this on their own? We have to talk about in our documentation why they need us, why they still need us, how we're progressing them, and how those underlying impairments impact what we're seeing. So we have to say to the whoever's going to be reviewing our notes, this is what the pelvic floor is doing. It's not holding, the reflex is untimely, and the patient needs me in order to help them to get to that independent level so that they can do these things and get to their goals. I don't think it's much different from the other diagnosis we treat, but I think when therapists get a little intimidated because they may not at first know how to spell that out for the insurer, once you do that and you start to get good at it, and if you find yourself talking to reviewers, sometimes you'll get a little pushback from them. Um, sometimes the reviewers will even say, well, isn't this something that's going to happen to all of us when we get older? I've actually had reviewers say that, that oh, so when they sneeze or they cough, they're leaking urine? Doesn't that just happen? And really the answer is no, it, it's, it can happen but it's not normal and we can address it. And I've gotten into very good conversations with people on the insurance lines on what it is we do and how we do it. And uh, some of them are actually very quite interested. They'll, they'll kind of say, gosh, I didn't really know we could address that. You know, my mom has that problem. And then they start to understand a little bit better. So there is quite a bit of education we still need to do in order to get reimbursed. Uh, and I think we have to not sit back and say, well, shouldn't they already know that? Not necessarily. I mean, if we want to be paid for what we do, we need to put a little effort into having them understand what we do, having them understand that it's very conservative and it is very effective. 
Well, you bring up a couple of really good points I just wanted to highlight. You're, you're talking right up my alley. And of course, both of us have been trained by the excellent Jacqueline Warshower, um, who used to be a Medicare auditor. It, Medicare's definition of skilled care is care of such complexity that only you can safely and effectively do it. And so this can be applied across the board, whether it's to pelvic floor rehab, where we're talking things up to the point where it's clear we have a complex knowledge that only we can be able to do. We can only safely and effectively do this care. So you bring up that good point. The other thing is you're educating the reviewers, which is just outstanding. Yes, it's, it's really, really wonderful because not everyone across the nation knows what we do. I, when I started the program, I'm in a smaller town and some of the doctors weren't really aware of what we can do. And a lot of the patients who come in a very common theme is, I didn't know this even existed. I wish I knew this existed 10 years ago. I mean, we have a huge push towards education in the area that I live so that people know what we do in order to utilize our services and understand why they're coming for physical therapy. And, you know, we find that on the reviewer level. So hopefully we're making grounds on that and it just becomes something they understand more and more and more so that they do reimburse and that we don't find ourselves getting denial after denial and having to address that because that gets tedious after a while. Well, that's, that's outstanding. And, and really, we should be doing that. One of the things I talk about in my documentation course is the fact that we really should treat the reviewers of our claims who are often nurses as people who need to be educated because they should not know our scope of practice already. Because if they do, that means they could have done what we did, which means it's no longer a therapy-only claim. Yes, that's a great point, definitely. So what are some resources you would suggest that therapists can utilize? Here, let me get myself back in the picture. There we go. <laughs> uh, I just have to keep shining a light on me and then it comes back. Um, so what are some resources? Let's try this again that you would suggest to therapists that they can use to better educate themselves in pelvic floor rehab? Well, the first thing I'm seeing a little bit is in the colleges, they're starting to give them a little bit of a background, which is wonderful. So we didn't have that before. Then we're starting to see some students or some new graduates are coming out with, um, they have already attended one course and the main courses right now toward certification are the APTA, so they have a women's section certification course, and that, that's what I did. Herman and Wallace also has a separate one that I think is very, very good too, where you'll go to a series of courses and in the end it ends in certification. Uh, both of them are allowing people who have not yet graduated to go to what they call level one, and that, that's really wonderful. We just hired a therapist who had been through Level one, she just graduated, and so she's ready to hit the ground running. Beyond that, I think we're at a great time in education where you can get a lot online, and some of it is completely free. Going onto YouTube, looking um, just onto videos of people who are already doing rehab in the pelvic range, we'll see a lot that goes out there, and it's, it's fantastic information. There are other places like, uh, Medbridge, who you pay a subscription fee to, and, and you have access to a lot of really good speakers, really good educators. I think that those are a great way to go before you go full bore into certification. I think once you hit certification and getting on that track, that's when people get really serious about it. But if you're just looking to get some information, I, I would say go online, look at some of these, these places. Um, I've I'd written some modules and done some modules for home CEU connection. That's another way you can just write in your own home, learn some things, do it at your own pace. You don't have to go away for a week and you don't have to take time off of work and get a really good basic understanding of pelvic floor how it functions, and how you can take that information. If you learn it tonight, you go into the clinic tomorrow. The, some of the stuff out there is really laid out there just like that. I, before I even went to certification courses, I did a lot of that, and it's fantastic. It's, it's wonderful information. I tell a lot of people you may want to start doing that before you go to your first certification course because once you're there, it's three or four days of sitting 
constant information coming. And if you don't have a little bit of a baseline knowledge, you can get information in overload and you just stop taking in everything. Um, so I think going through a variety of those sources is, is really, really a good way to go. And of course, books. I think people have forgotten about books. There's been a lot of good books written in the last five to 10 years on the pelvic floor. Um, there's headache in the pelvis. There's pelvic pain explained that you can go to and get information and use it immediately in your practice, even if you're not yet open to or maybe never see yourself doing internal assessments. Um, a lot of the pelvic floor therapists, the internal vaginal, internal anal assessments and treatments are what they do, but not everybody. So there's a wide variety of things you can do. If you are just kind of sitting there thinking, I'll, I'm just going to do orthopedics. I want to work with runners. I want to work with baseball players. I want to work with people in CrossFit. There's plenty of things you could do to benefit the pelvic floor that you don't have to do internal assessments and you can get them going in the right direction. So I think with all of the information out there and the variety of ways you can get it, you don't have to be so committed to say either I'm a pelvic floor therapist or I'm not one. You can kind of come into the middle and not have to put a whole lot of resources, being money and time into going places to learn it. That's great. So now I'm gonna give you an opportunity to restate uh, where your courses particularly can be found and what are the name of your courses? I created for Home CEU Connection um, three of their courses. So there's an overview of incontinence and then it's conservative treatment for incontinence um, and then also, just how to assess on a basic level, no matter what setting you're in, on treating incontinence and implementing some of the things like exercise, uh, bladder diaries to implement into your, the all various settings. My courses were aimed at being very able to go across the various settings. So. I didn't go into on those how to do an internal assessment, but what we did was we looked at, hey, if I'm a nursing home therapist where typically they don't do that kind of internal assessment, they don't get as deep in, what are the things I can do? What are some of the things I could do for every patient suffering from incontinence? I can do a bladder diary. I can educate on bladder irritants. So I kind of walk people through those, and it gives them a very starter package on how to get somewhere within pelvic therapy. And it's enough that if that's as far as you wanna go, that's great and you can take those into all settings. And it gives you a little bit of information that, hmm, I wanna know more and I think maybe I wanna join that whole pelvic realm of therapist across the nation. That's some of the information that they go over in the certification courses. So you've already got a little bit of a lead on it and you're ready to go in and dig deeper. Great. And so let's suppose, uh, remind me of the town that your clinic's in. I'm in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. So we're not too far from Scranton. Um, okay. We're right in the, the city of Wilkes-Barre. Um, we're kind of, it's like Scranton, Hazleton, Wilkes-Barre, Triangle there. Okay. And so for those therapists that happen to reside in your general area who want to refer patients to you, Again, the name of your clinic is? We're Elite Spine and Sports Physical Therapy. We're an elite pelvic rehab. So we're under that the same roof. If you're on Facebook, we kind of have two separate Facebook pages, but I get a lot of questions and things through both of them. And that, that's great. I, I'm the one who runs the emails on them. So you know, anybody has any questions can put them through there. Um, we, they could also call. We're at 570 uh, So we get a lot of calls. Um, I think, though, in this day and age, a lot of people seem to like the social media and like the you know texting questions. It's funny. I'll get them and I'll see their timestamp, like 1230, 1 in the morning. So <laughs> a lot of night owls are on there. The, yeah. Those are the home health therapists who don't, don't get probably. to sleep until really late. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> so that's a good way. I'm on LinkedIn, so I get some LinkedIn questions uh, from people, or uh, I, I'll get them even when they have a patient and they'll be asking, is this person appropriate for it? And that's wonderful, too. All right. Well, great. Well, 
Dr. Kristen Digwood, thank you so much for joining me on my channel and doing this interview with me. Well, thank you for having me. It's a lot of fun and it's great to see you there. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Well, folks, uh, this has been John Adamson, the Rehab and Documentation Guru, bringing you another subject matter expert to help you expand your practice, to make you a better clinician for your patients, and to help you get paid for what you do. Take care and God bless.